media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Jordan Bateman. He's the Vice President of Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association. Welcome back to the show, Jordan. Hey, thanks for having me, Jim. Jordan, more court challenges to the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which has been approved by the federal cabinet, who believes that they've uh, followed all the directions sent down by the Court of Appeal. What's behind these uh, new legal actions, and do they have a hope in hell? Well, I don't think they do. Look, it's a little bit of deja vu all over again, I guess, but, you know, it, it seems that Nothing the government does uh, in its approval process uh, will be enough for these um, pipeline groups who are opposed to the project. So, you know, they're going to throw every Hail Mary they can, uh, drag uh, governments back into court, uh, force taxpayers to pay more money defending uh, a, um, a process that, frankly, has been upheld in 18 out of 19 court cases. So, you know, 19 times they've challenged Trans Mountain, 18 times Trans Mountain has won. The one time it didn't, uh, federal cabinet had to go back and, and work on um, some more First Nations uh, uh, conversations and dialogue and, and you know shore up a little bit of uh, the, uh, the the plan on the water. They did both of those things. Uh, retired Supreme Court justice leading the way. So you know we believe they've met the threshold. These professional protesters, though, they, they they'll never be content. And, uh, you can, you can already see them. They're, they're spinning around like crazy. They've, they're throwing, uh, you know, 71 year old men into scuba gear and then ha- trying to get them to climb cranes out of the water to, to get arrested and to, to slow construction. Um, you know, they're holding press conferences, you know, claiming that, you know, CSIS is, you know, spying on them and, and causing them all sorts of troubles. These guys are desperate. Uh, and it's because we're in the closing days of this argument and the public has moved on and said, let's build this pipeline. We have uh, two First Nations groups that say they might be interested in buying uh, part or all of the pipeline. Does that show you that they're more interested in jobs and the economy than uh, protesting stuff that uh, doesn't bother them? Because it seems to me most of the protesters live hundreds of miles away from the pipeline. <laughs> Precisely. You know, the people who are closest to it generally are the ones who support it the most uh, because they know the economic benefits that will come with the pipeline. You know, it's really interesting and frankly exciting to see um, these groups of First Nations coming together, um, and and not just on one bid, but on multiple bids for uh, for a share of the pipeline. Uh, it gives me hope that um, you know we're maybe getting past the um, look the environmental movement, the professional protest movement, funded by you know American uh, billionaires with uh, their own agendas. Uh, you know, they've been trying to drive a wedge between First Nations and, you know, the rest of Canadians for a long time. Uh, they use environmental, they use their environmental arguments to try to, to create this wedge. The truth is, you know, First Nations and, and other Canadians are actually a lot closer uh, than we think. Um, you know, we think along the same lines as far as resource development. We want people to be out of poverty, whether they live on reserve or off. Uh, you know, we want economic opportunities for our kids and our grandkids. We want... Um, the revenues to come into our uh, for taxes to help pay for services, revenues that don't come out of our you know own pockets but come out of um, you know these uh, these types of uh, country building projects. So you know it's exciting to see them um, bidding on it. You know my suspicion is you know kind of be on hold until after the the federal election, which makes sense. It would be tough for a sitting government to to sell their stake in a pipeline with three months before an election. But no matter what. Um, at least they're showing confidence in it. The Eagle, there's the, the Eagle Spirit Pipeline in the north. They're going to uh, start talking with Alaska in, in order to get past Justin Trudeau's pipeline or um, uh, offshore uh, north north coast tanker ban. So they're talking to Alaska, but going through there, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the uh, 
uh, those First Nations who are a little bit more entrepreneurial. Uh, you talked about foreign influence on the environmental movement in Canada. Is uh, Alberta's new premier doing something about that? Yeah, Jason Kenney. He's uh, announced uh, an inquiry and an investigation into uh, many of these, frankly, anti-Alberta groups who have been set up or received uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars in funding from American co- uh, American foundations and then billionaires um, in order to fight uh, Canadian energy. You know, Jim, there was this really striking video out of Penticton. Andrew Shear was in Penticton this week, uh, you know, doing you know what you do in a uh, summer before an election. And this old elderly woman uh, jumped out of her car and went over to Andrew and just caught him video raw. I started talking to him about her son, who's 50 years old, lives in Calgary, has been out of work for two and a half years because the old company that he was an executive with went under, and how desperate she is for for him to get back to work how he's been searching for work and can't find it, how, uh, you know, they've had to sell some of their assets, um, you know, her home, she's moved, she and her husband have moved to a smaller home in order to help support him and, and his family. And it, it just, it, <clears throat> it's a good reminder that, you know, there are real Canadians hurting today because of the um, anti-Canadian policies uh, put forward by these environmental groups. And when you have the Tides Foundation uh, taking money from the states and putting it into things like Dogwood Initiative, putting it into, uh, you know, taking Rockefeller uh, Foundation money, and it goes to things like Lead Now, and they openly brag, Stand.Earth is another one, um, the Pembina Institute, these, these groups openly brag about shutting down energy projects, um, you know, uh, defeating politicians who support energy projects, and putting Albertans out of work. And, you know, this is an example, like, that. there's a real human cost to that. And, you know, this family has been through hell uh, in trying to deal with these these issues. Um, I, I wish that <laughs> these guys had the, the courage to look that family in the eye and somehow explain that this is good for the world, for those fo- folks to be struggling like this. Of course, they won't. They're cowards. They claim that they're not getting any of this money. We know they are. We've seen the, uh, the tax uh, declarations. Vivian Krauss has done incredible work on this. And uh, I look forward to seeing what uh, Premier Kenny's inquiry turns up about it. Well, I know they're complaining about sludgy oil that comes from Alberta. What about the sludgy oil that comes out of Los Angeles, where they've built uh, cute buildings over top of the donkey pumps that sometimes are right in the middle of schoolyards? They don't seem to be picketing those places. Oh, it's complete hypocrisy. You know, even as they were complaining about tanker traffic here, um, you know, Stuart Muir from Resource Works tweeted out, uh, about a, uh, a Russian tanker that picked up oil in Alaska, was dropping it off in the Puget Sound at the refinery, traveled through our waters to get there, and, you know, were the protesters at the dock trying to protest to turn away that ship? No, of course not. Were they, you know, was the governor of Washington State who's running for president on a <laughs> some sort of climate change agenda when he can't even get a carbon tax through? Was he there, you know, rallying, you know, railing against this, turning it away? No, of course not. So, you know, these American groups, more than happy to make Canadians sacrifice, make us pay more for oil and gas, you know, plunge our economy into recession, put people out of work in Calgary and in Fort Mac, but not willing to do the same thing for their own. So they're complete hypocrites. Um, and, and that's why I think so many Canadians today, by margin of more than two to one now, support the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline. We want more pipelines built. We're excited that First Nations are coming on board. And, you know, these professional protesters, you know, they're having to resort to stunts like sticking grandpas up on uh, on cranes and, you know, releasing da- documents that somehow claim that CSIS was wrong for keeping an eye on them when these groups themselves say they'll do whatever it takes to stop this critical infrastructure. So um, they're running out of money. They're having to find uh, different ways to try to stay in the public consciousness. But what they don't realize is the public has moved on and, and disagrees with them wholeheartedly. Sure, and if uh, people think environmental groups could be just uh, harmless entities, uh, go back to the 80s when we had the Squamish Five blowing up hydro lines in B.C., and they also uh, blew up a defense plant in Toronto and killed a person. So they're not absolutely harmless if they decide to go to extreme. Yeah, we hope they're harmless, but there are examples like that. You know, back during the Clackwoods Down days, and you know, support Berman should remember this. She was involved in it. You know, there were people, you know, putting spikes into trees so that you know loggers would come and cut down a tree, and you know, a spike would fly out at them and and cause damage, um, you know, and, and could cause injury. So things like this happen. 
they shouldn't happen. We, we don't want them to happen. Look, you know, speaking on behalf of the, the people who are going to build this pipeline, um, they don't want to have to be – there's enough safety issues to worry about without some idiot protester wandering into the middle of a construction site um, and, you know, maybe not being seen, not wearing proper safety gear, and then getting hurt or hurting, you know, innocent people. And I think of the RCMP officers who have to go, look, these guys were hanging off a bridge less than a year ago. Uh, RCMP officers having to go onto that bridge, you know, as their kids are watching at home live on TV, you know, and, and try to get these folks down, you know, all it takes is for a line to snap, for a, an accident, someone to struggle, and, you know, an RCMP officer is hurt or, or worse right in front of their kids on TV. So, you know, we need to remember there's a human cost to this, and, you know, the groups like Standards and Pembina, it's over. It's over. You guys lost in the court of public opinion. You lost in government. Um, this thing has been approved through all the normal means. Um, it's time to move on. What I remember about Sapora Berman the most uh, during the Clackwatt sound protests and their uh, court appearances is everybody involved in that movement smoked, including her. <laughs> and, and they're telling us, you know, they can't control their own internal environment and they're polluting mine. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I lost a lot of respect for them just because of that. <laughs> it's funny, I was just watching a YouTube video from the uh, 1950s of, uh, or 40s of a uh, Green Bay Packers star wide receiver endorsing cigarettes. And he's standing there and what, what will become Lambeau Field smoking a cigarette, uh, talking about uh, how it relaxes him before a game. So, uh, yeah, the, the world has changed. There's no doubt about it. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. Grand Portage Resources Herbert Gold Project in Southeast Alaska highlights increased gold resource, indicated and inferred, of 860,000 ounces, in excess of 10 grams per ton gold. Expansion drilling is planned on the Herbert Gold property for the summer of 2019. Grand Portage Resources trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, we had BC's NDP Finance Minister Carol James with a big smile on her face brag about how her government's policies of foreign buyer taxes of 20%, vacant home taxes, and special taxes on homes over $3 million had driven down real estate prices. Well, that means your home is worth a whole lot less than it used to be. Have you ever seen a government brag about wrecking your home equity and perhaps your retirement plans, you know, to make use of it. Yeah, usually the only governments that brag about, uh, you know, destroying personal wealth are uh, the communist ones that uh, were defeated by Ronald Reagan and uh, in the Cold War. Yeah, it, it's discouraging. Bluntly, a lot of her things, uh, a lot of her policy, so-called policy victories, really were just uh, fortunate timing with the uh, new rules around the Mortgage stress tests brought in by the um, brought in by the uh, federal governments. Um, you know, the, if you talk to realtors, if you look at the actual analysis, it's those stress tests more than anything else that have uh, kind of flipped the market to become a, a buyer's market. And you know, now we're kind of in this paralysis where okay, uh, no one really wants to pull the trigger on buying a home because they're not sure if it's going to continue to drop in value. Everyone wants to feel like they're getting the best deal possible, and you know, it's actually creating a snowball effect. I will say this. Carol James is bragging now. I bet you she won't be uh, quite so bullish on it as she has to stand there and release um, the financial statements for the province and, you know, property transfer tax and other, uh, you know, property taxes, other uh, relevant taxes will have uh, plunged because there isn't that kind of uh, market. And further, I, it's going to hurt retail sales as well because um, you think of, you know, uh, all the, uh, you know, when you refinance your house, Oftentimes you'll put some money in for renovations or you'll take the opportunity to upgrade your fridge or your dishwasher or, you know, if you follow Andrew Weaver's crazy advice, you'll take that money and uh, refinance your house and buy yourself an electric vehicle. 
Well, all of that is evaporating too because people no longer have that kind of equity in their home in order to uh, uh, refinance their house and, and purchase that. So retail, I think, will be down. Uh, we know housing will be down. Uh, those are have been major cash cows for government over the past 10 years uh, since the 2008 recession. Kind of concerning about uh, what that means going forward. Well, also, historically, uh, governments don't get reelected when housing values go down. Because people just don't yeah. feel as rich as they did before. Well, exactly. So, you know, this claim that they're making life more affordable works for that small group who can, you know, maybe are trying to get into the housing market. Um, but, you know, for the, you know, two thirds of British Columbians who do own their own home already, that'd be a little bit of a concern for them. Um, you know, uh, already we're starting to see in polling, um, Insights West was out with a poll today that housing affordability is less of uh, a concern for people now. And not surprising as prices go down. That's actually probably bad news politically for the uh, NDP as, um, you know, I don't think that, uh, you know, th- that's how they wanted to build their coalition. And, you know, they may think they're solving the problem, but uh, they're just creating a whole different group of enemies in it. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman. We were just talking about housing affordability. Well, even with lower prices, uh, homes in Vancouver still terrifically pricey for the average person or especially for the new home buyer. So they have to rent. Is it, uh, is Vancouver City Council making it easier for people to find a place to rent? No, Vancouver City Council is actually doing the opposite. Uh, in recent weeks, they've voted down two pretty reasonable developments, uh, low rise, less than six stories, um, simply because a, a group of neighbors have come out and acted as NIMBYs to stop it. And it's perplexing because, you know, rentals is definitely needed. Some of these were two and three. Uh, There's even a few four-bedroom units. So, you know, it would have been great for families. I uh, would have helped more people get into the market. But uh, this scattered council, um, yeah, uh, voted uh, to, to get rid of it. One such property now was going to have 19 townhouses. Um, but now, uh, you know, they'll just keep their old zoning. And the owner said, okay, well, forget that. I'll just build a nice new mansion for myself. So... Not sure how that helps the cause of uh, housing affordability. So instead of uh, homes for 19 families, you have a home for one. Exactly. And this one was the one that happened to be near uh, across the street, apparently, or next door to a hospice. Um, a lot of people in the neighborhood glommed onto that hospice as a reason to defeat it. But, uh, you know, this was going to have underground parking. Um, it was going to be uh, nice units for people, a uh, certain number of uh, rooms. You know, it just it would have made sense, a lot of sense for that neighborhood in that context. And at a time where government needs to be finding ways to, you know, encourage more housing of all sorts, you know, both ownership and, and rental, here you have uh, councils proving that they're very sensitive to public pressure. The, the the word is out in the protest community in Vancouver. If you can get 50 people out to the public hearing yelling and screaming at the uh, mayor and council, that mayor and council will buckle They'll fold. They'll defeat even the best uh, developments, uh, and they'll keep your neighborhood exactly how it's always been. The government's gasoline price inquiry in British Columbia, the major oil companies are refusing to divulge some information. Does that make these hearings useless? Well, the hearings were already useless. They were useless because government refused to allow, uh, refused to look in the mirror. They had no analysis of their own uh, tax uh, requirements, no analysis of what minimum wage increases meant, what property tax increases mean, no analysis of what the clean energy standard means. Um, these are all things that drive up the price of gasoline, but instead they just wanted to shift blame onto these, uh, these oil companies. Um, look, if I owned a company, I, I wouldn't give them my financials either. 
um, you know, that's proprietary information. That's how, uh, you know, that's something that every competitor would love to see. Uh, I'd be really reluctant to do it too, um, especially given the fact that I'm giving it over for a witch hunt exercise um, while the uh, people who are, you know, every bit is as uh, responsible for gas prices skate free and criticize me. So, yeah, I, I don't blame these uh, oil companies for being shy about giving their data to the Utilities Commission. Well, also when you tell a commission that uh, you can't look at government taxes or uh, there's another restriction they put on as well, uh, I think. Pipeline capacity, they can't look at anything to do with government. Right. Minimum wage increases. They can't look at the cost of property taxes and what that means for, uh, you know, these gas stations. Of course, gas stations have to have a little bit of a footprint. I mean, by, by nature, you have to have enough room to, you know, put down your uh, gas holding, uh, stuff underground. You have to have enough space for cars to get in and out. All of this is expensive. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, the, these guys should just, these companies should, you know, treat this a review as the joke it is. Um, if I were these companies, frankly, I would have uh, pooled our money and, and brought out a study concurrently uh, on the tax and uh, regulate, regulatory impact um, and release that either the day before or the same day as, uh, as whenever this review comes out. Well, of course, people flee across the border to buy gasoline uh, just across the line in Washington State, and the big difference is taxes. Because their gasoline is produced at Cherry Point, the same as most of Vancouver's gasoline. Yeah, no, I've I've looked at this before. Um, I think of the uh, it was something like uh, of the difference, ninety five percent of the difference was the tax scheme. The other five percent was probably the clean uh, clean fuel requirements we have in BC, which forces a special refinery uh, additive to be added, and that drives up costs as well. So. Yeah, all this stuff costs money. The difference between us and Blaine is taxes. Um, that, but that's why the Blaine drain occurs, Washington, and why I, I just can't believe the hypocrisy of, you know, Governor Jay Inslee running for president on a climate change platform when, you know, he won't touch taxes, fuel taxes, can't get a carbon tax passed. Um, you know, all these things that, uh, Bruce Clemens have to pay that, you know, Washington state has completely ignored. Now, isn't it also ironic as well, carbon taxes are supposed to drive people out of their vehicles onto public transit. Public transit just upped their prices. Yeah, totally. Well, and because fuel costs cost more and they're huge purchasers of fuel. Look, uh, there's a lot of hypocrisy and stupidity and all this. You know, John Horgan um, and Andrew Weaver want you to get out of your cars. And they have plans to continue to increase gas prices by increasing gas taxes until more people get out of their cars. So they're being really disingenuous and complete hypocrites. And frankly, you know, the, 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 the press should be all over them for the hypocrisy of this. How can you want to drive people out of their cars by raising prices and then, you know, oh, fold your hands and then get all concerned when, uh, you know, people start complaining that prices are high? This is exactly what the NDP and Greens want, um, and they should be forced to be held responsible for it, not be allowed to kind of wriggle off the hook and say, oh, it's all the oil company's fault. No, you're the ones raising taxes. You're the ones raising the costs. You want to get this out of our cars by raising, making it too expensive to buy gasoline. Just a minute. Quit being hypocrites about it and just a minute. Didn't the BC government just reduce the subsidy for people buying electric vehicles? Yeah, they just cut the subsidy for that. You know, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's a perplexing time. The NDP get a, a lot of a bit of a free skate because, you know, they still feel kind of fresh because, you know, after 17 years of BC Liberals in power, you know, the media are happy to have new cabinet ministers to interview and new deputy ministers to talk to rather than the same old crew. The problem with that is, uh, they're not really holding them to the kind of account they should be held on issues like this. And a lot of times, you know, public policy and, and government policy criticism flows back to more of a criticism of what the B.C. Liberals did, uh, you know, before this NDP government rather than actually looking at the B.C. NDP's record. So if you're out there, uh, you know, mainstream media reporter, uh, feel free to start actually holding the uh, actual government to account rather than the one that hasn't been in power for two years. What about the, uh, I would say, very poor rollout of legal marijuana in BC, where there's still only a handful of legal stores? The government. How do you screw up selling marijuana in this province? I thought we were all about marijuana. Well, that's exactly the question, and the premier just angrily snaps, "We're going to do it right." 
Well, why didn't they do any research? Go to Washington State, Oregon, California, Colorado, places cool. where it's been legal for right. almost a decade to find out what worked and what didn't. Because, look, it, 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 this is another huge issue. So let's take Kamloops. Heartland, center of the whole province here, you know, right there. We all know Kamloops. Okay, Kamloops has uh, had one of the first, actually the very first government cannabis store. Since then, cannabis, uh, Kamloops Council has approved 12 other private cannabis sellers. Not a single one of them have gotten their uh, approvals from the, fed, the provincial government. And today, the second provincial government cannabis store opened in Kamloops. So, you know, if you're a private owner, you're, you've got holding costs because you've had to rent space, you've had to put in, you know, uh, start hiring staff, get all ready, um, and, but you can't go forward until the provincial government gets out of the way and approves you. Meanwhile, the provincial government, you know, seems to find ways to approve, you know, two of uh, the public stores there. So, very frustrating, very unfair. It's happening, you know, there's a handful all over the province. Of course, you know, marijuana taxation revenue is now nowhere near the target that they thought they were going to hit because we're not selling enough of it, um, and people are still going to their black market producers like they always have because at least it's a you know, reliable supply. Um, when we're relying on organized crime for the reliable supply of marijuana, that tells you marijuana legalization has been a failure. So Mike Farnworth and John Horgan, uh, they need to get this straightened out um, sooner than later because eventually people are going to become more and more frustrated with what's going on. And you know it does show that you know, what was W.A.C. Bennett's old line about the NDP? Uh, they couldn't manage a peanut stand. Apparently, they can't manage a pot stand either. Yeah, somebody said it's incredible. Only the government could lose money selling drugs. <laughs> Reminds me of a story out of Nova Scotia where the uh, local hospital subcontracted uh, or, or got themselves a Tim Hortons franchise to in the main lobby there, and they lost money. They were one of the very few Tim Hortons outlets in the entire country to lose money, and it's because you know government forced them to pay you know twenty five dollar an hour union rates and benefits to all their employees. Um, only government can manage to screw up a Tim Hortons in uh, in Canada. Only government can manage to screw up the marijuana business in BC. Stats Canada just released a report saying that government marijuana costs about twice as much as uh, stuff bought from the black market. Is this, a, again, government's not taking a look at competition? <laughs> yeah, first, first of all, imagine being the Stats Canada guy who gets to go out and check that. No, 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 I swear, honey. No, I, I gotta go, I gotta go buy his marijuana. It's a, it's a thing for work. Um, yes, it, it, this has been the problem all along. And, and why a lot of the myths around, you know, all this marijuana tax revenue and everything we could do with it, uh, is of course more myth than, than truth. Um, you know, you've gotta basically keep the price low enough and get enough supply out there to drive the black market out of business. And then 10, 15, 20 years after they've been out of business, you can start looking at raising taxes uh, to kind of where it is for, for tobacco. Tobacco is often used as a model for this, but we need to remember, like, tobacco is terribly overtaxed, number one. And, and number two, um, you still have huge black market issues in tobacco. And we don't talk about it much here in the West, uh, even though, you know, there is Asian um, uh, Asian groups and, and cartels bringing in uh, cheap tobacco into into BC and Canada, but there was a study uh, a couple of years ago that showed something like one out of every three cigarette butts found on the ground um, in uh, in Toronto and in Vancouver were actually black market nicotine, uh, nicotine uh, brought in either by uh, First Nations or by um, Asian gangs. So we don't want this to happen. Uh, here with uh, marijuana, we want to get this right, and it's frustrating that they uh, it's frustrating that they haven't done it yet. Yeah, I've been in pubs where uh, people come around asking, uh, "Do you want to buy three cartons of cigarettes for the same price as one regular carton?" Yeah, and guess what people say? Hell yeah! <laughs> like it's like, and it's the difference is taxes again, right? Like you know, the taxes you, you can't find a provincial budget. I don't think. Let's see, I've been to seven of them, eight of them now. Uh, I don't think we've I've ever been in a provincial budget lockup where they didn't raise the tax on uh, cigarettes. Um, you know, cigarettes are taxed. We talk about housing being taxed, are ridiculous rates. Cigarettes even more so. And I get it. There's public health concerns, and you know, you, you want to eradicate as much as possible. And I think that government's been fairly successful in in slowing the number of smokers. But gosh, like you, you can't do that right now with marijuana. You've got to get if you're if you're serious about getting the black market and organized crime out of marijuana. You've got to be um, competitive, and you've got to make it, ex 
you know, readily accessible and convenient for people to change from their black market dealer to, to uh, the government or a private store. Jordan, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for having me. My guest has been Jordan Bateman, Vice President of Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association. His website, icba.ca. If you have any questions for Jordan or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.